This is the Lave HP2A, a fully discrete headphone amplifier with some quite unique design aspects that make it a very compelling option, particularly for owners of certain very demanding headphones like the Modhouse Tungsten, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm Golden Sound, and you're watching The Headphone Show by Headphones.com. If you like what we do here and want to help support it, consider Headphones.com for your next audio purchase. And buy with confidence thanks to Headphones.com's 365 day return policy. Before we begin, I need to say for the purposes of transparency that I've done some consulting work for Lave, so I've had some input on the design of both the HP2A amplifier and the Harmony DAC as well. I don't get anything if you buy one, my work with them is concluded and I've got no ongoing arrangements at all, but I still felt that it was important to tell you about that so that you know that I was somewhat involved with the design of this product. The HP2A is a fully discrete headphone amplifier which is able to deliver substantially more power than almost any other amp on the market, a whopping 20 watts at least at 32 ohms, and for high impedance loads where most amplifiers are limited to either 10 volts output or 20 volts output, the HP2A could deliver 60 volts or over 12 watts into 300 ohm. The output capability of this amplifier is much more akin to a speaker amplifier than it is most headphone amplifiers. It is immensely powerful and definitely geared towards driving headphones like the original Susvara and the Modhouse Tungsten. I'll talk more about the Tungsten specifically throughout this video because seriously if you have a Tungsten, this amp is one to pay attention to. Like Lay's DAC offering the Harmony, which you can watch the review for that either at the link in the description or click the card up top, the build quality of the HP2A is absolutely exceptional. The chassis milled from a single piece of aluminium in a matte black or silver finish, gold trimmings for the controls and cooling vents, and a big crisp display that makes it easy to see what's happening even if you're sat across the room using this as a preamp in a speaker setup. Which you can also toggle between the line outs and the headphone outs via the toggle on the front, or run both simultaneously. The remote is equally as impressive, again milled from a single piece of aluminium with enough weight to feel comfortable using this as a weapon if you had to. And again like the Harmony, in place of rubber feet we have three metal spikes. I'm personally not much of a fan of metal spiked feet just because it makes it much more likely that you're going to scratch whatever other device, rack or desk that you're going to put this on, but if you are buying these two together, both the HP2A and the Harmony DAC have small divots on the top that mean you can stack them without the need for any cups or aligning anything beforehand. But whilst the spiked feet are just something that my personal preference doesn't align with, but will be a bonus for others that do prefer spikes, one thing about the build I do wish was slightly improved was the volume control. The HP2A uses a resistor network volume control, which is great for having exact 1 decibel adjustments and perfect channel matching at all levels, but the actual dial itself, you can't move too fast or it doesn't correctly register each notch in the volume, making it a little bit hard to quickly turn the volume up or down. That is a bit of a downside, but in just about every other way, the physical build both internally and externally on the HP2A is absolutely stunning. If you're wanting to use more sources with the HP2A and be able to switch between them, Lave also offers the LEXT as an optional accessory that provides an additional set of XLR and RCA inputs, which is a pretty nice feature to have. And when using the LEXT, I couldn't measure or hear any differences versus just using the existing inputs, so it seems the implementation's been done quite well too. If you'd like to see full measurements of the HP2A, those are available at the audio file section of headphones.com, linked in the description, or again, click the card up top. But let's talk about the actual performance of the HP2A, and the first thing that we have to discuss is why this might be a uniquely ideal amplifier for driving a few specifically hard to drive headphones. One of the things that I told Lave was that there is a little bit of a gap in the market for amps that can fully and without any concern of hitting any limits drive some of these ridiculously hard to drive headphones, especially if you want to either listen pretty loud or put a big bass shelf on for example, and the most notable of these is the Modhouse Tungsten. If you do just want to skip straight to subjective sound impressions of the HP2A, you can go to this timestamp. I am going to be talking about power quite a bit in this video because that is the primary unique aspect of the HP2A. This is a headphone that requires a huge amount of voltage from the amp that you're running them on. Not necessarily current or power overall, it needs less current than a Susvara for instance for the same volume, but voltage specifically, it is incredibly demanding. You can use the headphones.com headphone power calculator, again linked to the description, to see exactly how much power and voltage and current specifically you need to drive a particular headphone to a given level. But one of the things that we discussed in our Do I Need an Amplifier video is why if you're listening at say 85 dB, you don't actually just want to put 85 dB into a calculator like this, because you need to account for crest factor, and actually you probably want to put an extra 20, maybe even 25 dB 
on top of the level that you're actually listening at. The volume that you are perceiving, and what's measured with most SPL meters as well, is not flat against all frequencies. If you play a 3 kHz tone and a 100 Hz tone at the same level, that 3 kHz tone will not only sound louder to you, but that SPL meter will probably tell you that it's louder as well. In fact, the A weighting scale, which is what most SPL meters will use, was introduced to accommodate the fact that we don't hear everything at all frequencies with equal loudness. And on top of that, whilst the sensitivity specification for most headphones is given either at or an octave or so around 1 kHz, the bass content in music can be drastically higher in level than everything at higher frequencies. And so the actual amount of power, current and voltage that you need to drive a headphone to your listening level can be a little bit more complicated than what it might seem based on an SPL measurement and or what you put into a calculator. I put the tungsten through a difficult but realistic scenario where I simply listened to a track, Murmuration by Gogo Penguin, and then turned it up to the louder end of where I'd usually listen. This gave me an 87 dB A weighted volume measured at the headphone, and we are at minus 2 dB on the volume control of the amp when feeding it from the Harmony DAC. Then, without changing the volume, I simply played a full scale sign through the amp to see what is the maximum voltage that at this listening level could actually be coming out of the amp at any frequency, and the result was 16 volts. This is above 10 volts, and given as many headphone amplifiers on the market are limited to 10 volts output, this means that on those amplifiers, this headphone at my normal listening level with that song will be clipping. Checking the song itself, we can see that it does contain content up to about minus half a dB, so at this level it'll cause the amp to output up to 15.1 volts. And looking at an FFT of the song, we can see that the bass content is 20 to 25 dB higher than the higher frequency content when looking at the song as a whole. So if you listen at 85 dB, you can't actually just work out what you need for 85 dB on a headphone because you have to factor in crest factor. If we add an extra 20 to 25 dB into the calculator, now the result that it's showing lines up much more closely with what I just measured. If you put even a small bass shelf on this headphone, listen to a song where the bass is a little bit louder in comparison to the high frequency stuff than this one was, or just listen a little bit louder than I do, then even a 20 volt amplifier, which is basically all other headphone amplifiers on the market just due to how the power rails are set up, then those amps will not be able to avoid clipping because regardless of whether they can do 10 watts at 32 ohms and have plenty of current to deliver, they're limited to 20 volts output, especially when you remember that decibels are logarithmic, 6 dB extra doubles your voltage requirement. But the HP2A can do 60 volts output, so even if you listen at frankly unsafe levels with this headphone, want to add a bass shelf or listen to extremely bassy music, you can crank this up and it'll drive these headphones perfectly in a way that effectively no other headphone amplifier can. Essentially, this is one of the most powerful headphone amplifiers on the market, by some margin too. I don't actually know how much power it can output at 32 ohms because when I got to about 20 watts at 32 ohms, I decided to stop there since my dummy load is only rated for 10 watts, so I was already pushing things quite a bit. I don't know how much power it can output at 32 ohms. Into 300 ohms though, 60 volts will get you about 12 watts, so yeah, this will drive anything. The one section of the market where I'd say this is probably not the most ideal choice is IEMs, because in order to achieve this massive power output, it does have to sacrifice a little bit of noise floor. With IEM use at 50 millivolt output, you get about 60 dB of dynamic range, which is a fair bit less than the 80 or 90 dB that you can get on more optimized products for IEMs. Turning up the amp to zero or the maximum, the gain of the amplifier is 13.7 dB, and it just has the one gain setting. And this means with a normal 4 volt DAC feeding it, the max that you'll get is 19 volts at the output. More than enough for basically everything, but if you are wanting to get up towards the 60 volts that the amp is capable of, assuming you do actually need it, then you will need a DAC with a higher output voltage. Options like the RME ADI2 or the Ferrum Wandler can both supply over 10 volts output, and so with those, you can get over 50 volts output at max. If you're looking for a source that'll allow you to get the full 60 volts that this thing can crank out, well, stop and reevaluate how loud you're listening, because otherwise, soon enough, you won't be able to hear anything. But how does the HP2A actually sound? Well, interestingly, this amplifier has, to my ear, a fairly different sound signature than Lave's deck, the Harmony. The Harmony was a slightly warmer, I would say softer sounding DAC than most, but the HP2A is completely the opposite. This is a very, very lively forward sounding amplifier, and there are some aspects of the measurements that show why this might be. It's got quite an odd order dominated distortion profile which does tend to make things sound sharper, and not only that, but as you go up to higher frequencies that level increases quite substantially. Like the Harmony, if you are wanting an ultra transparent low distortion device, this ain't it, but it's also not trying to be. The HP2A has quite a strong house sound of its own, and it's prioritizing being powerful, not just in objective power output, but in having a sound signature that to my ear puts full focus on dynamic impact and the faster elements of the music. 
For tracks where the ability to give a forward, incisive, and slammy sounding presentation is a benefit, it is a big benefit. When evaluating the HP2A, I found myself continually drawn back to a lot of electronic music. Haywire's Use My Love, or pretty much anything from Max Cooper, although Spike is a particularly good track, that's a favourite of mine. Both of those sounded notably punchier on the HP2A than on most other amplifiers. And whilst my personal reference amplifier, the Zale HM1, does do this particular aspect of sound exceptionally well, it's one of the reasons I love it so much, with certain headphones, like the Tungsten, the HP2A was outright the better choice, and again, a lot of that comes down to output capability. The HM1 is a powerful amplifier, and in particular handles high current output exceedingly well, even when you turn the feedback off. Basically doesn't rise in distortion pretty much at all as you go right up to high output levels into very low impedances. But, whilst this is great for things like a Hyperman Sesvara, and the Hyperman Sesvara where you are current limited, not voltage limited, I did prefer the HM1 over the HP2A. For other other headphones, like the Tungsten, the HP2A was outright the better amp because on the HM1 it was pretty easy to get it to clip. The HM1 is powerful, handles high current output well, but it is limited to 10 volts output, so if I just listened loud like I was doing earlier on that test or put a bass shelf on, I could get these to clip very easily. But on the HP2A, I can throw these on, crank it louder than I can bear, shove a massive bass shelf on for good measure, and it was just able to breathe the music through effortlessly. The HP2A's level of detail retrieval is kind of an interesting one, because whilst on first listen it comes across as exceedingly detailed, as you listen longer, you realise that whilst it is still a very technically capable amp, it is still very detailed, a lot of that is due to its presentation and how kind of in your face it is with a lot of the transients and higher frequency elements of the music, and this makes it come across a little bit more detailed at first than it is in reality. Though, as said, it is still a very technically capable amp, but just give it a slightly longer audition so that you can settle into where the actual level of resolution is. This livelier sound is very good for anything electronic, and a lot of pop music as well, but it does still hold up for more legato and sort of karma genres. I've been listening to quite a lot of Adam Balditch recently, thank you very much Resolve for that recommendation, seriously those recordings are incredible, go and listen to them if you have not done so already. And the HP2A's presentation of this track was notably different to most other amplifiers, it was a little bit sharper. In fact, the best analogy that I can give is if you took a photo and cranked the sharpness filter up a bit. It's not actually improving it necessarily, it's not adding more detail, it's just a little bit more in your face and apparent with it. This is still very enjoyable, and on a lot of tracks I did find that this was an effect which I really did quite like, but it does impose a little bit of a limit to the accuracy of timbre, and the one area which I would say that the HP2A is a little bit weak is female vocals. If you've got some female vocals, particularly higher frequency ones, they do come across a touch edgy, because there's not really much lower frequency stuff to kind of balance out the sharper treble presentation, so they come across a little bit too aggressive. Male vocals though, tended to just sound a little bit sharper and more textured, and it was something which on a lot of tracks I tended to enjoy. That was more of a trade-off, whereas female vocals did quite often struggle on this unfortunately. A lot of these characteristics are evened out to quite a degree though, when paired with something a little bit more laid back, like the Harmony DAC. These two work exceedingly well as a pair, and somewhat counteract each other's characteristics to give more of a balanced end result. The synergy here is very good, as may be expected given as these are from the same manufacturer. When using it with my primary headphone system DAC, the Ferrum 1 La Golden Sound Edition, I found that turning the tube mode on, which adds some second order harmonics, was an outright improvement 100% of the time, and I didn't really want to turn it off. Whereas when paired with other amplifiers, this feature is more of a track dependent thing, so it does seem like this amplifier is best paired with a warmer sounding DAC if possible. Overall, the Lave HP2A is one of the most powerful headphone amplifiers available, with a presentation that gives an extremely dynamic, punchy, and overall lively sound. This is something that isn't perfect for all genres of music, and I wouldn't say that this is one I'd give a blanket recommendation to for all listeners. For those that mostly listen to slower paced content, it is probably not the ideal choice. But if you do primarily listen to pop, electronic, or anything percussion heavy, this amplifier not only has a sound that suits these extremely well, but also for headphones that are exceedingly difficult to drive, like some of the RAL Ribbon headphones or the Modhouse Tungsten, it can actually drive these headphones to higher levels or with more flexibility for EQing the bass than other amplifiers will be able to provide. Lively, engaging, and just plain good fun. That's how I describe the HP2A. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you've got any questions about the Lave HP2A or any other piece of gear, music, or anything else at all, then head over to the headphones.com Discord server or the headphones.com forum, and I and other Wiggly Air enthusiasts will endeavour to help. Until next time, thanks for watching.